Okay. Well, that's a great it's going. Let me, let me tell you some of my own experiences and why I got into this field. I've always been interested in, 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 the nat in nature and particularly the various systems of the earth and how they work and how they related to each other. And uh, I was uh, drafted in World War II, but instead of going in the draft, I volunteered in order to get my choice of service. If you're drafted, you usually end up in the infantry. I didn't want to be a foot soldier, and so I volunteered and went in, and I served for 38 months during World War II. Uh, I was not a hero. I did nothing heroic, but I put in 38 months and spent time uh, in several schools uh, here in the States and then uh, served in Europe, going first to England and then into Germany when the war ended. Uh, and I came back with 38 years of GI Bill credit, which meant that uh, I could have essentially a free college education. I registered at uh, UCLA. I lived in Southern California, and that's where I was raised and so forth. Uh, at that time, UCLA, this would have been uh, probably about 1948, uh, 49, the cost at UCLA was $16 a quarter for tuition, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> I was on the GI Bill, and uh, that didn't mean anything to me. So I went to USC, which is a private school, and uh, it was, I think at that time, about $100 per credit unit, per credit hour. It was the same as Stanford. Stanford and, and, and SC had the same uh, schedule. So I ended up there. And because of my wide diversity of interests, I took classes of, of just about everything you can imagine. I liked, uh, I liked geology, I liked meteorology, I liked oceanography, I liked geomorphology. My interests in the earth were so diverse that, uh, and I took classes in everything. And it ended up that I had more than enough credit hours to graduate, but I didn't have a major. And so uh, they examined all of the courses I'd taken and created for me a special degree in earth science. And uh, uh, so my degree from SC is in earth science. Uh, from there I went to the University of Colorado as a teaching fellow. I had teaching experience there in the Los Angeles area. I was, uh, I taught early morning seminary and because of my teaching experience, I was accepted as a graduate student at the University of Colorado as a teaching fellow, which meant that I taught as well as went to school at the same time. Uh, when I graduated from that, and I graduated from that again in earth science, primarily the field of geomorphology. And geomorphology is the study of the earth's forms, its features. At physical features of the earth. Uh, from there I went to uh, McGill University in Montreal and uh, did about the same thing specializing at this point uh, in uh, Pleistocene geology and Pleistocene landforms which were glaciers and features formed by glaciers. And I went to Alaska uh, as part of the uh, geophysical year, the International GIGY, in 1956, and began studying Alaskan glaciers. Glaciers are sort of like skin cancer. You, you can never cure it, and there's no end. It goes on and on and on. I mean, how do you study? A, gl a glacier has no beginning, has no end, but I. Uh, studied glaciers and did my uh, doctoral
doctoral degree there at McGill University, again, in earth science. Uh, I was, uh, with my glacial studies, when uh, the International Geophysical Year came along in 1956, it was a cooperative effort by many nations of the world in order to determine fixed characteristics of the earth. And one of these was glaciers because it assumes that glaciers were a very sensitive historian of climate. They, they were formed by climate, they existed by climate, and they died by the climate. And so by studying glaciers, it was assumed that we would be able to find out something more about the trends going on at the Earth. We now call those, we called it the Earth energy balance. Now we call it global warming, but it's the same study. It's a study of what's happening in our environment. Uh, and I was, uh, because of my glacial studies, I was selected to be a part, a member of the presidential panel investigating the effects of the Alaska earthquake. In 1963, there was a tremendous earthquake, the largest recorded in North America, occurred in Alaska in 1963. And uh, there was a presidential panel named to investigate the effects of that earthquake. And so I was uh, selected as a member of that uh, committee to study glaciers and to see what effect the earthquake had on glaciers. And in some cases it was spectacular, in many cases it was negligible. Uh, my study in earth science uh, led me to uh, teaching at BYU. Uh, I was very fortunate to uh, go directly from graduate school uh, into a professorship. And uh, I did that because of one person. <laughs> when I was at Boulder, the academic vice president of the university was a man by the name of Earl Crockett. And Earl Crockett was uh, a native of Idaho and a very active, faithful Latter-day Saint. And uh, I met him and uh, went to church with him. And uh, he and I shared the teaching of, of an adult class in Sunday school. He would teach it one Sunday, I would teach it one Sunday. And Earl and I became very close friends, and uh, I had tremendous respect for him, and, uh, and I think that he liked me. Because when I left, uh, when I received my uh, award from McGill University, he said, when you finish and you want a teaching position, you contact me. Because he said, I think you're an excellent teacher, and we'll always out always be able to find a place for you. And so I was great. You know, it's who you know sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, while I was at McGill University, Earl Crockett became the academic vice president at BYU under Ernest Wilkins. Wilkinson. And uh, so when I finished my degree, Earl said, come on down. I'll arrange for a teaching position for you. And uh, so in that respect, I, I, was, I was very lucky to uh, go directly into, uh, into the academic world. One of the first things that I discovered was that science is what scientists say it is may or may not have anything to do with the truth. An example, when I was an undergraduate and studying Pleistocene or glacial geology, it was, it was accepted by all members of the academic community 
that the Ice Age ended 25,000 years ago. No question, that's what the authorities said. Everyone accepted, that's what they taught, and that's what I accepted. But then I found out later that other studies being done indicated that the Earth was not, that the Pleistocene did not end 25,000 years ago. A scientist in Sweden counted the varves in a lake. A varve is a very fine, thin layer. When muddy water enters a lake and the motion stops, the sediment comes out. And in the summer, when the streams are vigorous, flowing, carrying a heavy load of sand, gravel, all kinds of stuff, in the summer, it would deposit on the bottom of the lake a layer of coarse material. Much of it would still remain suspended. Muddy water can stay muddy for a long time. In the winter, when that lake would freeze over and there was no activity, those, the, the very fine particles that were held in suspension would settle to the bottom. And it would form a layer of very thin, very fine material. And they found in this lake, which existed right at the edge of the ice, the ice came down to this particular lake in Sweden and then melted back. In digging into the bottom of that lake, he found these layers. And so he says, oh, one year, two year, three year, four year, five year, six year. And he said, there are only 15,000 varves in this lake. It had to be, the Ice Age had to have ended 15,000 years ago. Everybody said, okay. So we went from 25 to 15. That's fine. No objection. Everybody believed it. I believed it. And then a scientist at the University of Chicago by the name of Willard Libby discovered how to determine the half-life of radioactive material. And he was able to determine that carbon-14, which is very mildly radioactive isotope of carbon, it's formed from the atmosphere. In the atmosphere, we have two distinct layers, one of carbon dioxide, and the other of what? Oxygen. What's ozone. the heavy one? Ozone. What? Ozone. There's, an, there's ozone. Ozone. <coughs> ozone. There is an ozone layer. There's a carbon dioxide layer. When the sun shines through that and hits the carbon dioxide, it breaks the carbon into four different isotopes. Oh, an, an isotope, very simply, Every element has a nucleus, and in that nucleus are charged particles. And the weight of the nucleus determines the element. Hydrogen has one. Oxygen has 12. But however many protons, which are the positive charges of the nucleus, that determines the element. Now. Around that are charges of neutra or the electrons, which are negative. Sometimes they balance the number of protons, sometimes they don't. And an isotope is a deviation from the standard number of electrons. So when the sun rays hit this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it broke that into several different pieces, for a better word, of material. They all had the same proton, they were all carbon, but they had a different number of electrons. And sometimes that was a very uniform and very stable substance. But sometimes it was out of balance and it would discharge or throw off 
some of those electrons. And when they did that, that's, right, that's what radioactivity is. It's the disintegration of an atom. And it so happens that one of those, one of those isotopes, and these various forms are called isotopes. Carbon-14, now see, carbon has 12 electrons. But there's also carbon-12, 13, 14, 11. Carbon-14 happens to be radioactive. And when the sun hits it, it finally, it settles down to the earth, and believe it or not, every living cell, including your own body, the wood, grass, animals, every living thing incorporates carbon-14 into itself, absorbs it. Believe it or not, you are mildly radioactive because you contain carbon-14. And as long as you're living, you continue to absorb that carbon-14. But as soon as you die, the process stops. And Willard Libby was able to determine how long... Now, one thing about radioactivity, it's energy being given off, and there's a fixed amount. There's a fixed amount. You can't give it off forever. But when, it's, when you stop, as long as you're living, you continue to absorb it. When you die, you stop. And all living things stop absorbing carbon-14. And Willard Libby was able to determine the half-life of carbon-14. And that was around plus or minus between five and 6,000 years, around 6,000 years. The decay, radioactive decay, is not a straight line. It's a... And so, actually, it never ends. Because what it happens is that during a, a specific time period, half will decay. During that same period later, half of what's left will decay. Then in the next period, half of what's left will decay, so you never really run out. And so the age is infinite. But you can tell the half-life. You can tell the half-life. Now Willard Libby discovered that when living things die, by measuring the amount of carbon in them, he could tell how old things were. He could tell when they died. He could tell how long they have been emitting this radiation. And he discovered in Wisconsin a place called Two Lakes where the last glacial stage, the ice advanced down to Two Lakes and in front of it, it knocked the forest down and covered that forest with ice. And then as the ice retreated, there was a spot you could tell, thank you, you could tell where the, uh, how far the ice came and where it ended, and he could determine which of those trees were killed by the ice and which were not. And you know what he determined, the ice age? We went from 25 to 15 down to about 10. And you know, everybody believed it. No problem. I mean, science is what scientists say it is. Another example. The Earth is, the Earth has, they, it has been determined, let me just say that, that the Earth consists of layers. There is a core, there is a layer surrounding that called the mantle, and on top of the mantle is the crust. And they know that there's three different, now there is a, there are subdivisions. 
There's lower crust, upper mantle, midder mantle, lower mantle, upper core, lower core, and so forth. But there are three basic zones. And they're distinguished by their density. That's the only thing we know about them. We know their density because we know the speed at which shock waves will go through them. Shock waves travel through a, a medium, whether it's air, water, whatever, rock, metal, and it travels at a different rate according to the density of the material. The denser the material, the faster the wave moves. And in measuring, if an earthquake occurs in a certain part of the earth, well, you can measure how long it took that wave to get there. There are two waves, one on the surface and one that goes below, the P and the S waves. And they travel at different speeds because one is fixed at the surface, but the other one travels at different rates because it penetrates those different zones. Now, all we know about those zones is their density. So the question is, here's the crust, below is the mantle, and then the core. What are they made of? No one has ever seen them. No one has ever touched one. No one, ever, no one has ever had any direct experience. But we know the density. We know the density because we know the speed of waves that go through it. So what have we done? We looked around on the surface, and we thought, aha, uh -huh. the density of the crust is the same as granite and granite derivatives, which is about 5.6. The, the, the mantle has a density of about 6.7, different from the crust. So we looked around on the earth, and you know what? we found a rock called olivine. And olivine has a density of 6.7. So you know what we've done? We've said the mantle is olivine. Nobody's seen it. But it has the same density, so it's olivine. It's gotta be olivine. It has some of the other characteristics of olivine. And the core, that has a density of metal. And it's probably iron. Because iron, in its pure form, has the same density as the core. And we know that about the speed that goes through the core. Nobody's seen the core. Nobody's touched it. Nobody's had anything to do with it. But we have decided that it is iron. So we've got granite, olivine, coal, iron. That's what the earth is composed of. There was a man who grew up in Ogden, a scientist by the name of Tracy Hall. And Tracy Hall, when he was a young boy, worked in a fruit market in, uh, in Ogden that specialized in oranges from California. It was a big market and it had oranges that were cheaper than anybody else. And when they would receive a box of oranges from California, he would take that box, dump it out. When it was, uh, well, I'm not going to, I've got a board here for drawing, but I'm just going to. Do you want me to hold it up? No, 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 no. When the oranges came from California, they're round and they were stacked. And what he would do is to take those same oranges, put a layer on the, on, the, on the bottom, and then he would stack one on top of another. Just like that. And you know what he found out? He could fill that box with oranges and have some left over. Because the others, the way the others were packed, round, and then the one in between, then this one, let me show you what I'm talking about. And 
then he would sing. This is the way they would come. And this is the way he would put them back. See how that, the top one? And he would end up, he would take a box that came this way and change it this way and he still ended up with a box of oranges, a box full of oranges, but he had some left over. And you know he thought about that for a long time. Finally he decided that that same principle could apply to other things, just not just, not just oranges. For example, he was intrigued by the fact that carbon, which is one of the most common elements in the earth, comes in several different forms. The most common form that we see is, I guess, like pencil lead. Pencil lead is almost pure carbon. And uh, batteries have a, a, a bar of pure carbon in them. The lead acid batteries do. And, uh, and, and it exists in the atmosphere. There's carbon right here in this room. And then there are diamonds. And you know what a diamond is? Pure carbon. How could you go from something like pencil lead to a diamond and be, it has a different weight, different density, different characteristics, and it's still 100% carbon in a solid form? He went back to this orange principle. And he says, I think that the molecules are stacked differently. And they're done that way by heat and compression. And so he designed a, 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 an instrument that I have seen, it's in, it was in the basement of the Iron Science Center, that was a tetrahedral ram press. It had a hydraulic rams that would push towards a, a, a common point. And he had these coming from different directions, all concentrating on one little spot. And he put in that, in that very center pure carbon, as a matter of fact, one of the purest forms of solid carbon is something very common, soot. Soot is pure carbon. So he put this pure carbon in this little box and with these hydraulic ramps, wham, bam, all at one time, wham. He gave a diamond. He produced a diamond. By heat and pressure, he restructured carbon from something worthless to something extremely valuable. Let's go back now to the Earth. Here's the Earth in three different zones. Crust, mantle, core. And we say that, uh, that they are granite, olivine, and iron. What if they're just the same thing under different pressure and heat? What if they're undergoing, a, he referred to this as a phase change. He referred to it as a phase change. Isn't it possible that the crust and and olivine are really, can really undergo phase change and become the, you know, one another? Something to think about. Maybe it's true. Maybe those same phase changes are occurring in nature. After all, diamonds on the surface are found only in ancient lavas that have originated deep within the crust under tremendous pressure and heat. Maybe that's what those zones are. 
There was a, a scientist in Russia by the name of Mohorovicic. And Mohorovicic was a pioneer in the study, the study of earth waves, of waves traveling through various parts of the earth. And he found out that the depth, the, the thickness of the core, or excuse me, the thickness of the crust varied. Well, and that's, that's obvious, isn't it? Where you've got a great big high mountain here, you got more crust. Well, he wanted, he, he concentrated on determining how far down did the crust extend and where, and he could bounce waves off of it, seismic waves. And he found out, I can't compete with the dog. <laughs> Mohorovicic found, he called this this line between crust and mantle a discontinuity because one discontinued and another one started. And so he started mapping the depth of that discontinuity around the earth and found that it was not a straight line. The crust doesn't end in a straight line. The crust goes up and down. And the most amazing thing he found out is that the bottom line is a mirror image of the top line. That where you have a high mountain, you have a dip in the, in the mantle. It's a mirror image. And he thought about that for quite a while. And comparing the density of the two, determined that of course that has to exist. Why don't the mountains just settle down by gravity and the earth be smooth? How do we maintain mountains? Well, they're slowly being worn away, we know that. But how are they maintained? They're maintained by deep roots. And that they, and that they are actually floating at the right level. High mountains have deep roots. And those deep roots are what, uh, and down here is this lower dense layer. And it's just like a boat. If you take a boat and you start loading it up, what happens to the bottom of the boat? It goes down, doesn't it? And it reaches and we, and we refer to this process as buoyancy. Light material is buoyant and it floats at the right height according to what's under it, to buoy it up. And he found that uh, some of the, uh, in, in, in mapping that, and they call it the Mohorovicic discontinuity or the moho, and the moho is that line between crust and mantle. And he found that, uh, and, and what, I'm, what I'm talking about here is that, suppose here we have a mountain range, and then here we have the, uh, where is that from? Give me that eraser out of there. Oh, I think the moho. That's already? Here's the shore line that extends out here to the continental shelf, a depth of 600 feet. Then it drops off. And what he found, here's, what, here's the surface. He found that the Mohorovicic discontinuity went like this. It was, a, it was a mirror image of the surface. And his calculation showed that this is up here floating at the right height, being buoyed up by this lightweight material here, and that the surface of the earth was 
in buoyancy. It's in, and we refer to this as isostatic balance. Now, there are some places where isostatic balance has not yet been achieved. For example, Hudson Bay in Canada, very large bay, was close to the center of a huge big ice cap. And that ice cap actually forced the crust down. The ice melted, the bay filled with water, and believe it or not, that bay is getting shallower and shallower all the time. It's the same thing with the Baltic in Europe. The sea between Sweden, Denmark, Norway is actually getting shallower. Not at a fast rate, but nevertheless, and we refer to this as isostatic rebound. One of the things that uh, at McGill University, they had an Arctic research station. And they found that the Canadian, those islands up north of Canada, uh, you know, you, you've seen the map, you know how it's dotted with all kinds of islands. Some are big, some are small. Some of those small islands were ringed with beaches. And they could never figure out how that happened. The sea, did the sea level go up that high? What formed those high beaches? And they have determined that it's isostatic rebound. The ice forced the crust down, and now the crust is slowly rising back up, and those islands are getting higher and higher and higher. And when I was there, there was one of the other candidates, doctoral candidates, who was doing a study of this. And uh, he showed me his work, and on one of these on one of these rings, which was a sandy beach ringing a small island. It wasn't a very big beach, but it was a small beach indicating sea level. Buried in the sand of one of those, he found, because this is in the Arctic now, he found the frozen remains of a shark in the beach sands. And so he thought, aha! Here's another way to find out how old the Earth is, or when the Ice Age ended. And so he took samples of that and uh, submitted them to uh, the University of Chicago, which at the time was the only place doing carbon-14 dating. It's done now why many universities, many laboratories can do carbon-14 dating. But the first thing he found out was that the sample was too contaminated to get a decent estimate. Um, and so he went back, and this time with uh, gloves and uh, dug into this dead shark as far as he could and, and uh, put it in, in bottles and sealed it all up and sent that in. And do you know what they came up with the age for that? 6,000 years ago. Who knows when the ice age ended? Now oh, there's a, I need an ensign. I have a great respect for Dalvin Oaks. I think he's a real scholar. He's, uh, he was uh, on our Supreme Court here in the state of Utah and uh, president of a large university, dean of a law school and so forth. He said, truth is defined as knowledge of things as they are, as they were, and as they are to come. We live in a time of tragedy, expanded and disseminated information, but not all of this information is true. We need to be cautious 
as we seek truth and choose sources for that search. We should not consider secular prominence or authority as qualified sources of truth. We should be cautious about relying on information or advice offered by entertainment stars, prominent athletes, or anonymous internet sources. Expertise in one field should not be taken as expertise on truth in other subjects. We should also be cautious about the motivation of one who provides the information. If the source is anonymous or unknown, the information may also be suspect. Our personal decisions should be based on information from sources that are qualified on the subject and free from selfish motivation. In other words, are they making money on it? <laughs> but I think that uh, this business of searching for truth and searching for knowledge about the earth is a very flexible and very tenuous thing. Within my own lifetime, I've seen change it after change after change. But the edge of the ice age, from 25 to 15 to 12, now he may be down to six. Who knows? Let me give you some advice. And remember that truth, that science is what scientists say it is. Be suspicious of someone who is unwilling to say, I don't know. When you find someone that has all the answers, boy, that should put the red flags like crazy. Uh, because I can, I, I can tell you from my experience that uh, people have asked me, well, when did, it, when did the Ice Age end? I don't know. I've been bombarded by so many different things. All supposedly scientific. <laughs> Be careful when you hear things. Uh, first of all, the source. Consider the source and the motivation of the person that's, that's, that's expounding. Uh, is there something in it for him or for his group? Uh, if so, those red flags ought to just pop up. But uh, one last, one last observation. I can remember a uh, a film that I saw of a group of so-called scientists interviewing Harvard graduates. They had a camera uh, set up outside the hall where these students had just been uh, granted their degree. And when they came out, still clothed in their cap and gowns, they were interviewed in front of this camera. And the, one of the questions that they asked these recent graduates was, what causes climate? And you know what the most common answer was? That's easy. Everybody knows that. Part of the year we're 90 million miles from the sun, and part of the year we're 93 million miles from the sun. When we're close to the sun, of course it's summer. And when we're a long ways from the sun, of course it's winter. What's wrong with that, Phil? Yeah, it's 23 and a half degrees is what causes. One thing is that the energy from the sun is not diminished by three, by three million miles. The amount received from here to here is the same. The second major problem is that while we're having summer in the northern hemisphere, 
they're having winter in the south and we're both just 90 million miles away. Then when we're over here at 93, we still have the opposite. You know, it's not that simple. First of all, energy from the sun is transmitted through space almost undiminished. You know what the proof of that is? I can see stars that are a billion miles away. And they're bright. You know, if they diminished by three million miles, uh, a, a billion miles, but, it, but we can see them very plainly. So energy from the sun is transmitted through space for all intents and purposes undiminished. And whether we're, or whether we're closer to it or farther from the sun, doesn't matter. But what matters is what Bill said. We're tilted. We're tilted. Look at this. Why didn't they put that straight up and down? You know, it's crazy. <clears throat> But you know what's also crazy is that this tilt remains constant. So suppose my hand was the sun, and this is the axis of the earth. It's tilted 23 and a half degrees from the plane of the ecliptic. The plane of the ecliptic would be this area, if we went around the sun this way, this was the plane of the ecliptic. We're tilted 23 and a half degrees from that. This part of the year, we're tilted towards the, the, the sun in the northern hemisphere. And as we, wrote, as we revolve around, the axis always stays parallel to itself. It's pointing up. What's it pointing at? Polaris. Polaris. There was a star up there. Right up there. And you know what? All these other stars are changing their position hourly. But you know the North Star stays exactly in the same spot? And once you know how to locate the North Star, I can go out there and point it out to you. Because I know exactly where it is there. And yet if you were to ask me where are any other stars, who knows? You'd have to have a star chart. They're somewhere. It's as if all of these are going around like this, and, and, and the Polaris, the North Star, is in the middle. And our axis points right towards it. And so when we're here, if that's Polaris, it's there. And as we, wrote, as we revolve around the sun, uh, two words, rotation and revolving. They're different. The Earth rotates. This is rotation. And it's always the same. Always the same. 24 hours to make one turn. Whether we're here, or whether we're there, or whether we're here. But now look what happens. Here we are, pointed towards the North Star. Here's the sun. Over here, over here, over here, over here. It always stays tilted. So you know what that means? Here, the southern hemisphere is closer to the sun and we're farther away. But that's not what makes the difference. When we're over here, look what happens. Now we're closer and they're farther. But what happens right in the middle? We're both the same. We're both the same. when we have the amount of energy that we receive from the sun depends on that angle. If you were to see the earth like this, said before, there are distinct layers in the atmosphere. And they're uniform. Uniform thickness. They extend up from the surface indefinitely because it just gets thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner finally we say well this is the top of the atmosphere 
but there's still a little molecules there that get thinner and thinner and thinner when the when the air earth is placed like this and if, if my hand is the sun suppose you are the sun Sam okay can you see the North Pole from there no can you see the South Pole yeah easy and it's, a tur and it's going to make one turn in 24 hours. Now, when the sun's rays, which are your eyes, they cannot, you can't see the North Pole. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to the North Pole, but it is on the South Pole. Mm -hmm. They must be having winter up here. Yeah. They must be having summer down here. And you know why? Because in that layer of gases that surrounds the Earth, the sun has to penetrate. First of all, it can't reach the pole. But as it strikes the equator, it strikes it head on. Which means if you're at the equator, at noon, the sun is right there. Straight overhead at the equator. But if you're at the pole, you can't even see it. And as you go down towards the, the, the equator, the sun would seem to rise in the sky from zero to 90 degrees down here. And when the sun's rays pass through the atmosphere, they're filtered. They're filtered. A good proof of this. It's difficult here in the mountains because of the, their mountain. Our sunrise is not the same as the sunrise at the ocean. Or if you're out on the Great Plains. If you're in the ocean and the sun comes up in the morning, when it first appears above the horizon, you can look right at it. You can even see that it's a ball. It's part of a ball. You can see the rim. And then as it gets higher, you, it slowly, as it gets higher in the sky, it's going through less filter. See, if, the, if this is the earth, here's the filter. The filter is the thinnest right here at the equator. And if the sun's rays come in here, they have a minimum amount of, of atmosphere to penetrate. But up here at the top, it can be shown mathematically, there is seven times as much atmosphere that the sun goes through. The Rayleigh scatter. Year. What? Rayleigh scatter. That's what it's called. Yeah. So that's what causes the seasons. Now, look, when, when we're pointing away from it, we're having right now, this, the, this is the north hemisphere, the black. Here's the sun. What season are they having? Winter. Winter. What are they having down here? Summer. And it's because of the thickness of the atmosphere that the sun's rays have to penetrate. And we call this, what happens on December 22nd? What? The, the solstice. solstice? The yes. The winter solstice. Solstice. Sol is the sun, and the stis means stopping. What happens is that as we revolve around, it appears to us as if the sun is moving through an arc of 23 and a half, and then another 23 and a half here, another three and a half over here, moves through an arc of 47 degrees. In the winter solstice, the sun is right there in January, at noon. In January, it's there. February, it's there. And by the time we get six months later, it's halfway up. Now look, if 
if, if, if my hand is the sun, this is the earth. Here, it's having long days, and here it's having long nights. But when it gets over here, for example, now, Sam, can you see both poles? Yeah. Yeah. And so if the, if, the, if the Earth makes one turn in 24 hours, every place on the Earth is going to have 12 hours of sun and 12 hours of non-sun. It, it can't call it daylight and dark because of the twilight and the dawn effect, which affects all of us. I mean, it's not black all of us. When the sun disappears, goes down, there's a, there's a twilight effect. And just like there's a dawn <laughs> effect before the sun actually comes up. But, so you talk about sun and non-sun. So over here, when you're here, every place is having equal day and equal night. What do we call that? Equinox. 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 Equal night. Equal night or day. Over here we're going to have, here we have the winter solstice, here we have the summer solstice, and then in between we have the vernal equinox and the autumnal equinox, the spring and fall equinox, because that's when the sun can see from pole to pole. So everybody gets 50-50. Now if you were to add it up, summer, winter, solstices, every place on the earth will receive 12 hours of sun and 12 hours of non-sun. 50-50, all places of the earth. <clears throat> but it varies, again, because of that tilt, so that we have we have long summer days, we have long winter nights. And it, over the year time, it adds up 50-50 for all places on the earth. But the difference is our distance from the pole. Is she going to be okay out there? Yeah, she'll be. I'll check on her in a minute. The, 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 the difference... At, do, do you realize at the equator, every day is the same? Every day is 12 and 12. And at the poles, there's six months and six months. <laughs> but it adds up. It adds up so that everybody gets the same. They get 50, half, half, half of the sun, half of the non sun during a year's time. That's enough. Oh. I give up. <laughs> oh. Did, you for, did you forget? Are we going to have a test or a quiz? Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess the, the quest I can ask is, have you learned anything? <laughs> um, yes. 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 Okay, that's the main thing. One thing you want to learn, and I cannot say it enough, science is what scientists say it is. And the majority of the scientists doesn't make it any more or less true. So, be willing to say, I don't know. So because what about that, the tides? I mean... You know, like all this stuff is boiling into. You do a quick thing on the tides for us, and on tides. Yeah. Yes, T tides are a function of gravity of the earth, and that gravity is influenced by two sources, mainly the moon, because gravity varies inversely as the square of the distance. Okay. So that at twice the distance, you have four times, or one-fourth, the amount, so that the moon, being close, has a much 
stronger influence than the sun. But the sun still has a small influence. But it's mainly the moon. And because water is mobile, uh, it is attracted. And for every force, there is an equal and opposite force. So that when we're pointing towards the moon, the tides rush out into the water, or out into the ocean, leaving the shoreline on both sides. So that you have high tides in the middle, mm -hmm. and, and then, so that you have it every six hours. Right. Because you have it four times during one rotation. And because there is also a portion of that is caused by the sun. If you have earth, moon, sun alignment, then you have extra high tides. And those are called, what are those called? When you have the opposite, mm. it's called a neap tide, but when you have ah. the, what is it? Can't remember the word, but anyway, it's a it's a it's a, it's an exceptionally high tide when you have the alignment of Earth, Sun, Moon. But when you have it at an, at an angle, then it's called it's another force, and when it's on the other side, it's at it again. So, uh, and 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 because the Moon rotate or revolves, gosh, I, it, you know. Even some of the poets have mixed that up, mm. the difference between revolving Revolve. and rotating. It says, when the sun, moon, and earth are in full alignment, the solar tide has an additive effect on the lunar tide, creating extra high tides and very low tides, both commonly called spring tides. Spring, spring tides, tides. and then the right? other are yeah. neat tides. Yes. Spring and neat, all right. right. Neat tides. Yeah. yeah. But you know, they are so accurate and so predictable that do you realize, Todd, that they have made tide tables for 25 years from now? Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Because they know exactly where uh -huh. the sun's going to be, where the moon's going to be, and they can pr make those predictions. 25 years in advance. That's Crazy. amazing. It is. That's amazing. Yeah. No, we do that a lot at work because you, you can set you know, whatever, we have to simulate all of that. So we have to have the moon at the right place and the sun at the right place for whatever year you are, whatever, you know, um, month. There's, yeah. And it's completely predictable. It's all mathematical. It can all be in there. Yep. See, and that's what, so that Rayleigh scatter, Dad, so you were talking about that, that what filters the, the sun. Right. So we, we have to calculate that because based on that's that's why we get the different color in in Absolutely. the sky because when the sun is 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 high and it's it's going through more that filter is more and so all the reds and and the blue you know uh, and the green well the reds and the yellows get get filtered out and we get the we get the blue right but when it's on the ends sunset and sunrise They're it's going red. through less so sure. that's yeah. So we, that's what mountains. causes the that's what causes our color in the sky ah. is how the the light. So not necessarily yeah, the the light portion of the sun's energy right. is that's why we get the color. And it's the you know when oh. Kodachrome color film was first invented, they had a series of filters. It was so sensitive that you had to have filters for the different times of the day because the light was actually different. In the morning, it's red. Yeah. The evening, it's yeah. red, and then at noon, it's blue. Because what? And so they had different filters to correct for that. But now they've made the so it's such like latitudes on the film that they don't need to do that anymore. But there is a difference between look in the evening, things go red, don't they? Mm -hmm. But it's because of the filtering effect of that thick atmosphere. But in the day, they're they're not red, but in the morning they are. So you get it through the thick atmosphere in the morning, you get it through the thick atmosphere in the evening. I'm 
through. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.